How are you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Guys, great discussion coming your way as requested. I have a friend of mine, Professor Gi Giuseppe Fazzari, and he is also behind the film that you guys can find on Amazon right now called Why They Kill. And today we're going to take a theory that he's well, uh, well connected to, a theory that he strongly believes in, and we are going to relate that theory to Wade Wilson. We're going to try to break down Wade Wilson's crime and try to figure out if we could discover why he does what he does or why he did what he did as filtered through the theory. It's going to be a great show. Joe is a phenomenal guest, but he's also a very good friend of mine. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of all of Joe's work, especially, as I said, this this movie. So if you guys do get a chance, you are going to want to check it out. It's called Why They Kill. But let me get Joe on. What's up, Joe? My friend, Anthony, how are you? Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be on with you. Uh, I'm on. I'm actually excited for this show. But Joe, do you mind introducing yourself to our audience, please? Sure. Giuseppe Fazzari. Uh, uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, uh, Anthony, a professor at uh, Monmouth University and uh, director and writer producer of the film Why They Kill. Uh, and as Anthony mentioned, available to, uh, to watch on Amazon Prime. Now, Joe, I'm a big fan of that uh, that movie. I watched it a few times. Uh, I was able to actually see it a little ahead of time as well. And we've also interviewed you a while ago uh, when the film was just released. So if you guys look for, just put Why They Kill, Tear Talk, and it shows up. But Joe, I, I know um, I gave you a call recently, so I know this was kind of last minute, but I want to thank you again for coming on. I, I did a show recently on Wade Wilson. It got a little traffic, so I kind of want to, keep the momentum going. There's people that are fascinated by Wade Wilson, both for good reasons and bad reasons. I mean, some people are fascinated because they find him to be the sexy thing, uh, but also people are fascinated because they're curious about what type of monster does these things. And real quick, when you, when, when I kind of mentioned his case to you and you went ahead and did all the research, I even told my wife, I said, you know, when Joe looks at something, Joe looks at things totally different based on his background. Does that affect how you look at anybody that commits a crime, specifically this type of offense? Yeah, generally speaking, what happens is, and you know, you, you, um, you know, Anthony, I, I wasn't in corrections, but I spent my, the lion's share of my career uh, managing the trial courts in uh, Essex County and Union County. So, you know, so score hundreds, scores of, of individuals come through to criminal courts in those respective uh, districts and counties. And so generally speaking, when, um, you know, sometimes when you see folks come through that system and you get some of the intimate details of those folks in, um, you know, through the PSI and through the criminal case history, you could kind of start to see some patterns. And so, um, and I know just to back up and to preface all this in terms of what you mentioned, there is a fascination. You see it all over the news uh, for folks, you know, like you and me who have been in the system and we've seen uh, lots of these types of uh, criminals, uh, rapists, killers come through the system. You know, we're probably not so enthralled by it, obviously, but for, you know, the common lay people, some, there are reasons why people are drawn to these kind of true crime things. You know, they, there's obviously uh, an insatiable curiosity about it. Um, you know, it's a part of the evolutionary kind of psychology behind the two murder, rape, those are that, you know, all part of the human, human experience, human society, uh, since, you know, time immemorial. So since the hunting and gathering days, right. And so we're instinctively kind of drawn, I would say to some of these tales and the more absurd, the more ludicrous, um, uh, like in this case with, uh, Wade Wilson, uh, the more of that draw, it will take, and, you know, and then on the other side of it, of course, people were drawn to it, you know, much like the OJ Simpson trial all those years ago, you know, um, you know, people get, will watch it to try to get a sense of satisfaction. They feel that justice has been served, quote unquote, there's a final, they're seeking out that final resolution. So it's almost like an extension of watching, you know, a Netflix series or an Amazon uh, series on television or something like that. Uh, you know, there's an empathy piece as well that people sort of, uh, will empathize with the family of the victims and they feel sympathy for their plight. And so consequently, they're drawn to those kinds of things, um, you know, in, in, in that respect as well. You know, concerns about justice, all these. And then, of course, you know, you have a, a type of thing that goes on like this and you're reading the story and you're doing sort of the background um, 
background review of what occurred in this particular case, it kind of gets that blood flowing too, the adrenaline going to see what what's what's happened. And so, and so consequently, you know, people are again, people are drawn to these kind of true crime stories for you know a plethora of reasons, some of which I just mentioned. So, so I'm yeah. not I'm not really to be honest, I'm not entirely surprised um, that it's drawn the kind of attention that it's drawn. Right. We've lived long enough and we've worked in the system long enough that these kind of things are really not su entirely surprising to us. Yeah. And I also think the media also connects to, a, uh, you know, connects it to a larger than life because not all uh, true crimes get this type of attention. So the media also adds to it uh, a little bit, you know, and, and kind of creates a larger than life image uh, that makes us actually even more curious about. Yeah, they, they, um, they Certainly they contextual they contextualize. Um, you know, the, the bigger picture there for everybody, for that consumption, right? So, you know, it's a very passive, when you're watching this kind of stuff on television, I don't watch much television, but, and I don't get my news generally through that medium, but if you're watching it through television, it's, you know, you're consuming it, right? So they're basically kind of like feeding you that information. So it is a very passive medium, you're consuming it. So, uh, and, and they, and they, contextualize it the way they want to contextualize it. So some of that also kind of, you're right, kind of some will sometimes feed the frenzy. I, absolutely. Yeah. And it's funny because no, depending on which network you watch, you'll have one that feed, feed the victim side. And what I mean by the victim side is Wade Wilson being the victim of circumstances, which we'll talk about, uh, which made him the man he became. And then you get other people that will watch it because they want accountability and, you know, they're going to watch, kind of shows that showcase the monster that he is with no forgiveness. Now the show is going right. to be those, those oh, two okay. pieces, the empathy piece and, you know, that sense of satisfaction, seeking out justice. Right. So you're getting, you're absolutely right. You're getting folks from all different types of corners that are drawn to this, uh, to this particular, um, uh, this particular defendant in the case. Yeah. Yeah. And I like to believe that I kind of don't lie on each extreme. I try to look for the middle dialogue. That's why it's great to have someone like yourself on because but we're that's not. Why the, the, that's why you're the best, Anthony. Uh, yeah, I wish. Uh, but I want to mention, so, so the audience knows. So Joe is familiar with a, th uh, with a theory that we're going to bring in today that Joe is going to relate the crime to this theory. If you're not familiar, uh, the inmate on the right or the left, sorry, maybe your left, my right, whatever it is is uh wade wilson he is responsible for the deaths of christine melton and diane ruiz uh joe's gonna break it down because he definitely did some research and he's gonna filter it through his theory and it's a really amazing theory it's gonna kind of graduate from the victim all the way up to being kind of like the victimizer which means that we're going to be open to uh two very extreme perspectives on both sides we're going to be open to the perspective of maybe his young life where he could have been victimized or whatever it is and then it's going to graduate to him eventually assuming the role of being a victimizer correct i mean is that how the theory kind of graduates right so the the um the theory that the film is based on is based on the uh, the theory by the renowned criminologist uh, Lonnie Athens. He's um, you know professor, uh, and his theory um, that he refers to is the theory of violentization, and it has basically four stages to it that we go through the film. So the first stage is the brutalization stage. Uh, the second stage is belligerency. The third stage is violent performances, and the fourth and final stage is ruralency. And so. You could take um, you could take a case like the the Wade Wilson case, and you could take a look at it and really kind of see how he kind of kind of essentially fits the mold. Uh, and so this case, you know, there's lots to unravel. Uh, there are lots of uh, facets to the case, and, and mind you, much of which that is not available to the public, right? So you're not going to know the full story. But I think I'm convinced, based on what I've seen, what I've read, uh, and what I know about the case. Uh, there's a lot there that kind of fits into uh, Athens's uh, violinization theory. Uh, and so we kind of break that. We, we kind of give, um, we kind of, we spend a little bit of time in the film talking about his, uh, uh, about his life. But the, the, the major part of the film is really centered on his theory. Uh, again, the theory of violinization. And so, um, so we could see how this, this particular defendant, Wade Wilson, kind of fits the mold. And I'll tell you what I tell my students. Uh, when it comes to theories, I think I don't really see any theory uh, necessarily as a black and white kind of perspective. I look at it in all sorts of shades of gray, 
And I kind of like to think about theories in terms of, um, you know, more right and less right. And I base more right and less right in terms of how it can, uh, how is it best, uh, if at all, practically applied in the real world? Like, does it apply to our practice in criminal justice? Does it make sense? Does it logically follow? Um, are there exceptions and anomalies to what this theory kind of uh, is putting forth? And I think his theory of violent, and obviously I think a lot, I think very highly of it. I mean, you know, I made a film about it right, of course. And, and I've written about it. Um, I think it's more right than not, right? I think it's, I think it's the most right. Uh, are there exceptions to it? You know, probably, potentially, I'm sure there is. Uh, but I think for the most part, it kind of, I think it really, I think he's done uh, an exceptional job of really kind of providing us with a good solid basis and reasoning as to how you take any benign human being like a Wade Wilson, right? He wasn't always a violent, crazed killer, so to speak. You know, how do you get this? How does this, how does this man go from this benign human being in our community to killing two women basically within the same day of each other, right? Um, so I think he really provides a good, solid background and good foundation for that. Yeah, and guys, this is a perspective. I mean, granted, you guys can take the perspective and do it with what you want. Apply it to other areas of knowledge you have, or it's just an added perspective. And no one is saying here what we provide here is one hundred percent, but it's definitely a perspective that's rooted in experience. Because not just yourself, but also Lonnie devoted their life to this, uh, to understanding why people do what they do. And I wish. Someone could have videoed or audioed our dialogue uh, when I was leaving work today, me and you were chatting, because when I was trying to under understand how this theory works, so it's going to go from brutalization to belligerency. I kind of wrote them in. Um, uh, violent, uh, some words get to me. So no, no, no. violent performances before virulency. Oh, it's okay. Apologize backwards. Okay. Violent performance. And then uh, that, that last Rural, word, man. Virulency. Virulency. Yeah, virulency. So me and Joe, when we yeah, when we were having this discussion, Joe simplified it in such a way where basically he said, listen, you're basically painting the picture of, of a victim to a victimizer. Get it. And then I said, I asked Joe, I said, you know what, Joe? I, I know that a lot of people, because especially the adopted parents recently did a letter. When they wrote the letter, they pretty much blamed everything but the actual person who did the crime. They basically held everybody else accountable. And the part of the letter that got me a little upset was he starts to blame the death of the two girls also on the criminal justice system. I was very upset with that. But with that said, I want people to realize something. Accountability, and this is something me and Joe thought of in the vehicle. And I don't think something it's been it's been expressed like this before, but accountability is not forgiveness. And I was hoping that Joe can share the difference to, to, with between the two because I want the audience to understand that we're going to give you a theory that's going to have someone that could have had a troubled childhood and they became into the, uh, the man that they are now, the monster that we see. Uh, but at no way are we use, utilizing who uh, his experience as a child to minimize what he's done as an adult. So this video is not about forgiveness where we're looking backwards in an effort to find out who he is to forgive the person, but rather accountability is just accountability. Regardless of your background, you did what you did and it's time that you're held responsible. So I was wondering if we could cross into that a little bit, forgiveness and accountability on that scale. Yeah, they don't, exactly, Anthony. I, I You know, it's not, they're not mutually exclusive things. In other words, um, you could have the, you could have the, the family member uh, of a victim. And we've seen this in the courts. We have family members of victims who forgive the assailant. They forgive the defendant. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't want them held accountable, right? You could forgive somebody and still hold them accountable, right? The system could still do well by you with respect to getting you to help you need, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to hold you accountable for the action because ultimately everyone uh, everyone, uh, is held or, you know, in accordance to law to the, to those actions. And so uh, adults anyway. Um, and so, and so that, that's, that's some of what we were talking about with respect to the, to the, to the, to the, to the difference where people kind of take a look at it and says, well, you know, we've got to forgive the person and therefore, you know, how do we hold them accountable if the quote unquote system has failed them? Um, and I could, I, again, I could empathize with what, the defendant's family, the, the adoptive parents. I, I saw that. I I was I listened to the uh, to the sentencing uh, hearing 
when the defense counsel recited what the, the defendant's fam, uh, adoptive parents had said uh, about him. And I, and I certainly, I mean, you know, they're parents, they're a mom and dad, and, you know, I could empathize with what they're saying about their adopted son, uh, where and when and, and the why of it all, frankly, are academic questions, right? Why mm. does, why does someone do what they do? You know, we're having, and I'm enjoying the academic discussion, obviously, but ultimately it's an academic discussion. Mm. The system doesn't necessarily, like in the film, I'll tell you, we, one of the, uh, one of the, um, uh, defense counsel that we interviewed for the purposes of the film, you know, he said, he goes, look, when I'm with my client, I never asked them, Hey, you know, why did you do this? They're not interested in that. They, their, their job is to basically make the state prove their case beyond the reasonable doubt and hold them to that standard of beyond the reasonable doubt. That's their job. They're not looking as to why and the when and the how and all that kind of stuff. That those are really kind of academic questions uh, that, frankly, we have the um, the opportunity this evening to talk about. Uh, the system doesn't look at it that way. The system is, you know, what did you do, and to what extent, in accordance to the law, if found guilty by a jury of your peers, if you're going to be held accountable for those actions, and that's really the, the and that's really it. Um, you know, so when we talk about those four stages, you'll notice, and if you take a look at, at uh, Wade Wilson's background, what you'll find is that, you know, he was in and out of the system constantly as a young adolescent, as a young male in the system. Um, he was, uh, you know, since the time, I, th I believe, from what I read from the time when he was 13 years old, uh, he was suspended from school for selling drugs. Um you know, in and out of the system as, as, as a young adult, as I mentioned, uh, you know, and charged with, I think, more than almost two dozen different types of crimes, in, including uh, assault and fraud, um, you know, all sorts of trouble in school. His classmates uh, characterized him, uh, I think it was in the latest Newsweek article, characterized him as being, quote unquote, a troubled young man, always in trouble. Um, uh, there was one instance where, you know, he would, uh, he would, uh, you know, you know, would, um, uh, you know, vandalize vehicles for no good reason other than for the sake of vandalizing them. Uh, and people described him basically for, you know, what appeared to be for no other reason, right, uh, than other than to do damage, you know, to that property. So you could see, you, you know, you could see a sort of an escalation. Uh, to what he was doing over the course of his criminal career, uh, up to unfortunately to the point where you know he took the lives of these two uh, these two women. Uh, prior to there's the other um, the ex girlfriend I, I believe her name was Kelly Matthews, who described you know the fact that much of what he did to those two women he did to her. He had he was strangling her. He, he broke her foot in the in in the car door while he was. You know, um, he basically kidnapped her, uh, strangled her, gagged her, tied her up, sexually assaulted her, and drove around, you know, the Florida Keys with her. Um, and you know, um, but for some happenstance of whatever whatever occurred there, uh, she wasn't killed. And so, and when she reported it to the police, you know, some of the controversy that's happening now is when she reported it to the police, the police found that she didn't have any probable cause, so they couldn't charge him with the crimes that she had um, allegedly um, stated that he had committed against her. Uh, he had, he had claimed to the police, I believe in, in the article mentioned uh, that, you know, she, you know, she was into that sort of thing. She was into this rough sex that, you know, she was into her, him, you know, um, assaulting her and biting her in, in, in one instance. So, um, you know, what, what transpired over the course of, 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 uh, of her, um, uh, filing that complaint against him and why the police didn't take any action or if in fact they didn't have the necessary probable cause. I don't know all the specifics of that particular case, but the point that I'm making here is that you saw this kind of escalation, right? And some of the same things he did to the women that he ultimately killed, he actually did to that ex-girlfriend. Uh, and there were other claims of other girlfriends that he had that where he, where he assaulted them. Uh, and you know, and, you know, people will ask, well, why didn't that, why didn't they report it? Well, you know, as well as I do in the system, uh, when, when women are sexually assaulted, a, a, a large portion of them do not report, uh, 
crime to police for a variety of reasons. So the fact that they didn't report it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It just means that they didn't report it. Uh, but we saw this sort of pattern sort of coming uh, coming uh, into a performance. And that, those, those things that he did essentially kind of falls into Athens' third stage with violent performances, right? You've moved from the violent um, self, uh, the, the violent resolution that you're going to attack somebody to either seriously injure them, maim them, or kill them, right? That belligerency stage to now actually carrying out the act because saying you're going to commit a violent act and then actually doing it are two separate things, right? And so when you commit that violent performance, right, what happens is, uh, what happens is uh, that's where if you have wins or losses, so to speak, quote unquote, that becomes kind of critical to whether or not you go on to that fourth and stage of virulency. And obviously he had some success in his violent encounters. He was assaulting women uh, and, you know, was getting into all sorts of trouble uh, as a young man. And he probably had a lot of success, obviously, in those violent performances, success in terms of committing the violence and not being defeated or not being, mm. um, not being arrested and, 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 and sentenced to a long-term prison sentence. Right. So what occurred is he just kept going down. Uh, he kept, he kept going through those stages ultimately until he's reached now this ultra violent self-image that he has of himself, the rural and say, so interestingly, if you, if you, and anybody could YouTube it, you could watch it. It's on, it's online. If you take a look at the sentencing, you'll notice that there's a portion of the sentence there that, you know, he's there, but he's not there. You know, he's smiling at the judge, knowing full well that the judge is going to basically give him two death sentences for the death of those women, right? For the murder of those women. He's just there basically smirking, smiling. Um, and very sort of, you know, very even keel about the whole experience. So what that shows me is that you have a man here who is, has that ultra violent self image that Athens describes, uh, and is fully embedded in that rule and say, right. That's the first point. The second point, uh, that I wanted to make is, um, you know, ironically, the person who turned him in was his biological father, as you know, and his biological father testified against him in that case. And what I found really chilling and really sort of um, uh, remarkable is what his father said his demeanor was like when he called him on the phone. His father described his demeanor as excitable. He was excited about the, the murders that he committed. And he wanted his father, right? He was conveying that emotion to his father in such a way that he wanted his father to feel the same exact way. So you've got a person who is taking pleasure in that notoriety. He's taking pleasure in that physical attack of other, of the, of these women. He took pleasure in instilling that fear, uh, and, uh, and making those women feel powerless, uh, and ultimately taking their life. Uh, and in the process, you know, shaming them and humiliating them uh, in terms of how he uh how he killed them and so he took great pleasure in that in which case um you know what's remarkable about that is it really sort of fits very neatly into lonnie's uh lonnie athens's fourth stage role and say right yeah before like yeah so i know we gave a little bit of a quick little breakdown i know we're going to go in detail a bit more but i wanted to ask one more thing before we really detail this breakdown, both in theory and how it's applied to the Wade Wilson case. But I wanted to ask one thing, because you're, you're obviously you're familiar with the court system way better than I ever could be. I, I noticed when you got pretty much someone that's down to rights guilty, uh, you know, the defense side will switch to the why so they can get the blame game going so they can. Everything else is at fault, but the individual. And it makes sense. I get it. You got to win your case. So let's just go from, hey, we got him dead. You know, they got him dead to rights. Let's try to question motives and everything to put some shift of accountability. Uh, so you said that the reason why you really favor this theory is because this theory actually may be one of the stronger theories when it comes to accountability, correct? Uh, correct. So um, you go from, you go from stage one, right? Which is the brutalization where um, essentially uh, Anthony, what you're looking at is you're looking at a, at a, at a, at a, 
human being that goes from the brutal the person brutalized to the person brutalizing right so you go from the brutalized to the brutalizer and that's what you have here it's a classic it, it's a classic example uh, of a uh, of a of a man going through these stages um now we don't have all the information and we may not have all the and we may never get all the information but i'm i'm sure that if you did enough digging and you delved into this you'll find at some point or another, um, uh, this guy was brutalized at some point. So you want to take, you know, so you go, if you see, a, if you, if you could take it as like a film reel and go all the way to the beginning and you looked at the person being brutalized, you're going to have a lot more empathy for that person than antipathy. When that person goes through all those stages and then just becomes a vicious killer, at the end, in this rulency stage, well, of course, the lion, the, you know, the, the, the greater public is not going to have that same level of empathy, right? They're going to want that accountability. Um, they're going to want the they they're going to want justice to be served, irrespective of what's happened prior to that. Um, and I'll mention this again. You know, I've mentioned this before. You know, my many years working in in the in the courts in the criminal justice system and now teaching it, uh, I, I tell students. The same thing i'll tell you that the problems of the criminal justice system actually are not in the criminal justice system they're actually in the family courts so mm. if you want to kind of see by the time that guy gets into my criminal court by the time that guy leaves my criminal court and in the sentence right and you get the judgment of conviction and he shows up at your prison the problems with that individual started way before i met him and certainly before you met him Right. It happened generally probably happened at the family court. Right. In a, in, in a household that maybe had lots of domestic violence in it, in an education system that, you know, um, didn't give the right coaching, uh, wasn't around the right kind of um, didn't, didn't have the right guidance. Right. Got mixed up in the wrong crowd, um, had all sorts of uh, negative peer influences, maybe with gangs and drugs and what have you. Um so all those kinds, all sorts of those negative influences and uh, bad experiences uh, that lead to all kinds of levels and uh, instances of trauma, right, negatively impact that person. So you're going to have lots of empathy with those folks. But the point is that the time to really address it is really not necessarily in the criminal courts, and it's certainly not in the prisons, although we're saddled with that, you know, and it's a part of the job, we have to do the best we can with what we have in front of us at that time. Um, but the time to really address it to nip it in the bud, uh, so to speak, is when the person is in that first stage is in the brutalization stage and is in that belligerency stage, prior to them committing any of those violent performances, any of those violent acts or getting mixed up in all sorts of uh, criminal activity. And that means that you're you're targeting the people when they're very young and they're first exposed to the system. So if that person is being first exposed to us in the juvenile courts, well, that's really where you have to put your resources and your efforts to make sure that they don't continue to graduate, so to speak, from one stage to the next. And that may have saved or may have uh, may have made all the difference in this in Wade Wilson's life, and therefore all the difference in this case. Right. We'll never know. Uh, but we're past that point now. Right. We're we're past that. We're at a point where we're at a point where he has that violent self-image. He's got the 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 interpretation of his um, of uh, his primary emotion that's linked to violence. Athens would refer to it. I would submit to you that uh, that and Athens would refer to it as what's called frustrative malefic interpretation where. He's got a hatred and an anger-based violence and that he's just prone to violence and he's willing to commit murder for it as he has. And so we're way past that stage now. So you can't go back and say now, well, the system failed him. Well, okay, whether you think the system failed him or not, that does not mean that we can't, we, we're, we're, the, the system uh, can't hold him accountable because – to be fair, there are folks that have all sorts of traumatic experiences, have all sorts of problems and issues that don't go on and murder innocent human beings, 
right? We can't have a system, the system, we can't have a system where folks do all sorts of the, the worst atrocities uh, in the, in, that we know as a community. And then at the end of the day, we don't hold them accountable. What kind of system do you have then, right? So, you know, there's got to be some level of balance and, and, and reason when you're thinking through these things. Well, that's kind of why when we had that discussion in the car today uh, and we were talking about accountability being very surface, accountability is pretty much were you there or were you weren't or you were not there. I mean, pretty much very simple. Were you there? Were you not there? Where the why it could just be so interpreted in so many different ways, but it also could be used as a distraction. You know, let's just, hey, I know you got him there dead to rights. Now let's focus on why he did it and see if we can build on empathy, see if we can build on the human emotion. And and one of the things we talked about was that, you know, as I said before, you know, we're, we're looking backwards. It's like, well, what are we really looking for? Are we looking for accountability? We're looking for forgiveness. But one of the things that I think is interesting, Joe, is that working in the correction system, right? And you mentioned the family court. I, uh, I, I love something that you said, you know, so... We know that prevention happens in the streets. And what do we mean by prevention? I, I'm, I'm talking about more for gangs. Let's talk about gangs in general, right? Uh, but it's going to relate, I promise you. Let's say, uh, you know, on the streets, prevention is just providing good home life. So it's never an option to stray uh, into whatever that negative culture is, you know, the gang culture, right? Uh, but then if they do start to get mixed in, then there's a different uh, approach. You're going to intervene. Because now you got counter influence. you got forces that could be against you that you now have to battle a little bit more. Once they get to the prison system, uh, to some extent, it may get to a point where they're at that level where it's not about prevention or intervention, but more about suppression. I actually think that when you start crossing to like these initial four, four levels that you have, the four stages from brutalization to, I hate that last word, virulency, really? um, virulency, right? I, 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 I think you don't have the prevention there. It goes right to the urgency of intervention at the first two. Correct. Right? Because the person's already crossed the threshold or right. almost. So when you get when you get to the point of um, when you get to the point of that fourth and final stage, uh, can you have a person turn it around completely and get fully rehabilitated? You know, anything's possible, certainly. Uh, but I think uh, as a system, right, a policy, if you will, uh, is best used during those first two stages uh and we have the resources um you know and uh, we have the resources we, we just need to find the way of doing it and it can be done and it is being done it's just not brought together in concert the way it should be in some ways and so in terms of intervention you're right the, the best way to intervene and to ensure that they don't graduate to the third and fourth stage and really commit some of these atrocities as we've seen in this case is really to intervene during that first and second stage. You know, ideally at that first stage, when you're seeing someone, you know, you and you see this now, like you see the sort of push against, you know, bullying in schools, right? That's brutalization. That's a form right. of brutalization, right? That it could that can that could um, that could create all sorts of trauma for that young person. Uh, and and mind you, the, the the young person that's going through these stages. You know, there's no timetable to it either. Someone can go through it very quickly or it could take years to go through it. So there's no timetable. You know, Athens will, will, will you know, indicates that there is no timetable on it. So it doesn't necessarily happen, you know, over the course of, let's say, a high school or a grammar school, what have you. It can, it can happen over a very short stint. So and I just to back up a second, you know, we're all human beings. Right. And so we all empathize. You know, it's a tragedy all around. Right. It's a tragedy for the victims. It's a tragedy for those adopted parents, you know, and, you know, frankly, it's a tragedy for all of us to bear witness to any of this, to see mm. any of this happening, you know, uh, in, in, in the 21st century, uh, in, in what we hope we, we expect to be a civilized society. So it's a tragedy no matter way, the, what way you look at it. But, you know, I'll submit to you that is the importance of having a judge at the centerpiece of our justice system, right? So once the jury makes a decision in our system that the person is guilty beyond the reasonable doubt, and then the sentence is carried out by the judge, you know, in New Jersey, for instance, when the judge is sentencing a defendant, you know, he or she is allowed to look at both aggravating and mitigating factors in determining justice, in determining what is the right sentence 
for this individual, given the particulars, given the circumstances in this case, so that we look at that. So we do have empathy as a system. We, that we have human beings at the center of this. And that's the importance of having a judge. You know, we're not just plugging this the data into a computer and letting an algorithm decide what the sentence is. We have a human, in, a human being, an individual with all their life experiences, looking at the totality of circumstances and making the decision, what's the best decision given the circumstances for this defendant, justice for the victims and the wider community and society. So we, we have that, we do that. Yeah, and, and what's crazy is even when they, as I said, we cross into the white, once something has been introduced, uh, it has to be exhausted. You know, so when you have people trying to introduce the why, and then, you know what, Joe, if you do look at like the three, prevention, intervention, and suppression, maybe prevention does play a part the way you explain it, where maybe brutalization is a combination of prevention and intervention, uh, but more more so on, on trying to stop um, you know, stop people from actually uh, maybe bullying the individual because the, the big thing here is that I, I think, and, and you tell me if I'm correct, I would like to go to the actual theory, but I had prevention and intervention and brutalization, intervention and belligerency, and the last two would be suppression because at that point, it, that's where I think the accountability starts to fall. But also in the first stage where it's brutalization, uh, is that where you start to, like if, if I'm being bullied constantly as a kid, uh, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm also trying to grow into being that man. So my, my emotions, I'm all, I'm all puberty, a bunch of stuff's being mixed in there. Uh, if, if I, if, if everybody that's around me is treating me like crap, it's hard for me to build a connection to the human element. So at that point here, uh, do I start to lack empathy? Yeah. You start to see the world. Basically you start to see the world, your interpretation of the world uh, is that, uh, that it's a dangerous place. And there's, right, and, also and there's violence. So when you're looking at uh, brutalization, this is where someone is being violently subjugated, right? Uh, personally assaulted uh, or threatened, right? Um, there's a per what Athens refers to as a personal horrification. Uh, you witness others being assaulted and violated, right? Let's say, for instance, you know, you're a child and you're in a household where there's, you know, domestic violence, um, um, you know, you, you, your witness, you vicariously, uh, live that trauma through the other person. So if the, you know, the husband is beating, is beating up on the wife and, you know, is an alcoholic or what have you, and there's, you know, violence occurring in that household. Um, the other, the other thing is, um, that's related to, uh, brutalization is violent coaching. So this has to do with the people who are in that person's quote unquote primary group, the individuals that they're surrounded by, uh, family, peers, um, you know, other, um, other individuals that they're connected to violently coaching them, basically teaching them how to execute violent behavior. Um, and so they're, they're around that environment that um, basically subjugates them and horrifies them to violence. Yeah, and 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 Joe, I'm sorry, it's such an interesting dialogue. And I know people want to see it. I got just one more thing because it's what you bring up, and then I promise you guys we'll rush into the theory. Uh, and it's just good dialogue. Do you think, like, let's say you said being a witness to that, right? So let's say I'm a witness to my mom getting assaulted, right? And maybe I only see the world in two ways: either you're a victim or you're a a, a victim, whatever it is. Either you're aggressive or your prey, your predator, your prey. Maybe that's what it is. The right. two extremes. So instead of seeing that there's a middle there, you wind up adopting the 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 extreme of being the predator because it's I don't want to be prey. Correct. So you wind up creating. So once you make that decision, right, you create what's a violent resolution. You move into that second stage, the belligerency stage. And here the, the subject or the actor, it reinforces um, that kind of violent warlike attitude uh, to the situation uh, that he is confronted with, right? So um, they become emotionally attached um, to decide to be violent when it when violence is called for, right? So he's going to now, but that that's just a resolution, right? You're, it's just something that's happening within yourself. You're saying, "I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna use violence myself." Saying it and doing it are two different things, though. 
once you do it, right, then you've moved, once you physically have done it, so now you've moved from resolution, the belligerency stage, to actually committing violence, now you've moved from stage two to stage three, mm. right? And, 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 you see, and you see some of this, um, if you, you, you know, listen, if you, if, you know, and if you think about um, uh, the, uh, the most notorious strangler in American history was, uh, uh, was Albert DeSalvo, the guy who allegedly was the Boston strangler. If you look at his background, right? If you look at his background, he grew up in a household with other siblings who were, who was emotionally, psychologically, physically abused by an alcoholic father. Um, and, you know, his father used to beat him with a pipe. Uh, and when he talked about it, uh, when, when confronted about it as a sort of form of child abuse, he didn't even see it as child abuse. He said, well, I didn't, I, you know, he said that I just didn't move fast enough, essentially. So they don't, the person who's being brutalized may not even see it as abuse, right? He may, he or she may see it as something that, you know, uh, is the reality of the world, something that um, they may even deserve, right? Um, and so, and we get into some of that in the film. So this, uh, the Salvo basically, through that brutalization, made a resolution to use violence on others and ultimately leading to violent performances and ultimately to that, um, to that last stage of role and say, do you uh, think it's, re do you think it's related to him? Uh, you know, n I don't know, kind of maybe wanting to be like his father, because that could be the person that was, even though he wasn't the best role model, he's still the person well, that has the greater influence. So that, that's a good point that you make. So in the film and, and uh, Dr. Athens came up, comes up with what actually is my favorite concept to, to the theory. It's what's called the phantom community. And it's all about, you know, everyone who's got, you know, we all have voices in our head, right? We're all guided and counseled. And that, that counsel, that guidance that you hear in your head are actually folks that comprise your, what's called the phantom community. So his father, the Salvo's father, is a part of that, uh, is a part of his phantom community um, and is a part of that violent self-image. You know, interestingly, the guy, uh, the defense counsel, for the Salvo was the same one of the defense counsel for OJ Simpson, uh, F. Lee Bailey. And when F. Lee Bailey um, uh, talked to the Salvo about one of the victims that he strangled was an elderly woman. Uh, and when uh, Bailey was talking to him about the, the, the age of the victim, you know, interestingly, what, what uh, the Salvo responded is it had nothing to do my violence and my my uh, my strangling of that woman had nothing to do with her age, so it has nothing to do with with respect with what we ordinarily are going to think about. It had everything to do with the violent act, right? Everything in terms of how he interpreted this other human being's actions, demeanor, attitude, you know, the way he perceived that individual in his own mind, right? Um, one of my favorite quotes that we allude to in um uh in in the film is by the american sociologist uh charles uh, uh charles cooley he says i'm not who you i am not who you think i am i am not who i think i am i am who i think you think i am so it's about how do you, how do i think you perceive me right that's my interpretation and individuals who have that violent self-image see everything in that um see everything in that violent um uh malefic sort of frustrative kind of interpretation that's how they see it that's their perspective it's how they see the world and it's how they see other people around them yeah that's and, and now joe if you don't mind uh again just to kind of you did a lot of studying on wade wilson recently i was wondering if now we could just kind of filter through the theory, you know, run through his crime, see how this theory applies. And at the end of the day, I know at the very beginning, guys, there's not a lot of fact, but Joe firmly believes that if you look hard enough, uh, you will find a child that uh, probably was bullied and, and picked on and definitely uh, started hanging out with the wrong crowd. And that kind of opens up the door to the other level. So Joe, I was wondering if we could kind of now apply this theory and, you know, kind of see how it fits into Wade Wilson. Right. So I, I don't, I, there's not a lot out there 
but I'm sure that if you had access to, um, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm sure in, in the Florida system, if I remember correctly, I mean, I'm sure they do a pre-sentence investigation report, something that the judge is going to, in New Jersey, we have probation officers that, um, that, um, uh, that complete that document to provide the judge prior to sentencing. So Florida has something similar, I'm sure. But if you take a look at that document, that'll probably give you a nice kind of rich history in terms of his background and, and the kind of um, experiences that he had. But even that document itself may not even give you the full complete picture. But I'm sure that if you had access and you had the ability to review what, what occurred over the course of his life, I'm sure you're going to see some serious levels of trauma there. I think you're going to find some really negative experiences that impacted him adversely. Um, here's, here's, the, here's the other key piece of it. Uh, the fact that uh, he was adopted by itself Think about the kind of emotion that that generates, right? The, you know, emotions of potential abandonment, no one wanting him, so on and so forth. So that, that in itself could be emotionally jarring and how people react and uh, deal with that sort of thing, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, is, uh, you know, could be different. It, it's, it's obviously, uh, it's, it's not um, it handled the same by everyone. And so consequently you have, uh, you know, you have, uh, I'm sure you have some instances of that brutalization that occurred over the, over the course of his life. The belligerency at some point or another, you could see it was probably in his early teens uh, that he made a resolution uh, to commit criminal activity. And you see, uh, as, I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, that he had a series of, uh, that he had a, he had a series of uh, run-ins with the law. You know, 20 different crimes, everything from assault to fraud to vandalism to drugs, being suspended from school, uh, how his classmates uh, characterized him, and the kind of trouble that he was seems to have regularly and constantly been in over the better part of his childhood, over his young adolescence. So we have we have testimony to that. We have individuals who characterized him in that so at some point or another he made uh he made that resolution uh to pinpoint it we don't know exactly when but you could base it you could probably get a good sense of it based on you know his initial exposure uh, uh in the uh, in the criminal justice system then prior to that in the juvenile system uh with respect to that third stage the violent performances well, we, we've seen it. Everything from the girlfriends that he had prior to, uh, you know, Kelly Matthews uh, and then Kelly Matthews herself and, and the testimony she provided um, and to obviously the, the, the two women that he ultimately uh, wound up uh, killing. So they're obviously, and there, and there were violent performances, there were criminal activities that was becoming more and more uh, serious leading up to the murder of those two women. And then ultimately to stage four is where he, um, he's gonna commit those violent, dangerous acts uh, uh, to gain control of others, which he did with those two women. Um, you know, strangling the one woman, uh, attempting to strangle the other one, and then ultimately killing her by running him over with his car. Uh, again, instilling fear, uh, humiliating them in, in the way that he killed each of them, um, and the excitement uh, that he had in that kind. That's really very, the, the, probably one of the more remarkable things that I heard and read about the case is the, the, his demeanor when he contacted his biological father. Uh, now, you know, was he into, you know, there's all sorts of other um, uh, testimony talking about his addiction issues and and his and and his uh, uh, his drug usage and all that is true, but that doesn't take away the fact of the the violence and the stages that he went through. You know, you know, it was part and parcel of that whole process. And 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 Joe, can I ask you a question? As you read through this, you know, and you, let's say you get to the last step too, what you're talking about here. I mean, once someone really is able to apply the theory to let's say Wade Wilson, or I'm sure this theory applies to 
you know, a lot of people that have committed crimes or, or maybe it's supposed to apply to all. I, I don't know. But this actually is basically what can help determine if this person's worth saving or if this person is strictly needs to be held accountable for what they've done. Right. So if you, you know, that that's the, uh, that's the interesting thing also about the theory is that um, it makes concessions, let's say for where the person is within this, within that spectrum. Right. Uh, it's can they go backwards, Joe? I'm sorry. Can they go backwards? You mean go from rural and see to violent performance? You can go back and forth. You mean. I mean, I, you, yeah, you know how, like you mentioned, like, well, let's say, uh, could they enter, let's say, violent performance and then realize, or maybe there's some humanity in them where they, they actually. Well, what happens is if, if you go through violent performance, it's like, let's say you attack, you go to physically attack somebody. Let, let's say, you know, sort of classic example, right? Let's say you're on the, you, you know, someone's on the bus and someone looks at the other individual that they perceive as disrespectful, right? And they wind up attacking that individual because they perceive them and the way they looked at them as being disrespectful, right? And when they go to attack that person, that person just beats the heck out of them, right? Well, they're going to stop. <laughs> they're going to stop there. You're not going to move forward. Now, so that's where the wins and losses in violent performance really count. If you've had of a series right? If you have a series of wins in that violent performance, you're going to enjoy that notoriety and the quote unquote respect that you've earned by being violent, which kind of pushes you towards that last final stage of, of rural and say, right? Here's the other piece of it. You know, when you're uh, individuals, let's say who are um, in the belligerency stage and they get locked up for something and, uh, um, you know, they may put their violent performance to the test in the prison setting. Right. That's why it's very important that when you have folks in custody, that you make sure that um, if you if you apply this theory to the folks in custody, you want to make sure that they don't continue to go down those stages. So when you're talking about, let's say, protective custody and, and uh, protecting the individuals that are under your care, it's important because you don't want to make a situation that's bad and exacerbate and make it worse by the time they ultimately ultimately you know ultimately leave the institution uh, what is it like 90 percent of the folks entering the institution ultimately get released right so you don't want to make in the interim while they're in the institution and incapacitated you don't want to make a situation that's bad worse right you don't want to put a person who's in stage three and then by the time they're released now they're in stage four and you're releasing them out into the community right so so ultimately this tool was put together uh, not just so much even to really, I mean, yes, it's put together to understand who they are, but the focus is, is understand how, what we need to do. Yeah. So if, for instance, like um, you could, you tailor it, you, you could tailor it. So we discussed this in the film as well. We, we, we talk about like, if you take this theory and you, you make application of it, you explain it to a judge or to a prosecutor, corrections officers, police, the practitioners within the system. They immediately grasp it. They see the 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 application of it. It resonates with them and their experiences. It resonated with my experience. I've been exposed to the theory for many, many years, but I saw its application more so ultimately when I was in those criminal courts and certainly in the family courts uh, where I'm seeing some of these young people who are coming in as juveniles. And then unfortunately, regrettably, I see them then as you know, many years later, I would see them as adults in the criminal court system, right? In the adult system. Um, and then sometimes, you, you you know, they wind up leaving my system. You may see them in yours, right? And then, you know, kind of round and round we go. Um, but there's real application here if, if uh, and that's part of the reason I made the film. I wanted to get it out. I, I was intimately familiar with the film for most of different reasons, but, you know, namely from what I did for a living for so many years. But um, this theory, um, uh, one of the reasons I, uh, I made the film is to get it out to the, to the, to the, to the mass market, right? It, to put it into this different medium where you could, uh, you could readily accept it to make it more accessible, readily access it, access it. Yeah. And, and Joe, I want to go one more thing and then we can kind of wrap it up. But when I, I'm not an expert in true crime, uh, but I've definitely worked around enough individuals um, to kind of get an understanding to some extent, because 
uh, when you work in the prison system, you always got to kind of see the wolf, uh, you know, so you don't fall gullible into believing everyone's a sheep, if that makes sense. So you got to kind of always ask why, look for that motive, you know, what, what, you know, even when someone's giving you information, why are you giving it to me? You know, it, you know, you don't take things at face value. Uh, at the very, uh, you know, after he killed Melton, I, this is my interpretation. I believe, I think he knew he was on a point where he was bound to get caught. Now he crossed the threshold. It's over. And I think that's when he started going, uh, you know, becoming a little bit more uh, aggressive, even killed uh, the other girl practically in, 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 you know, killed her in daylight, ran her over with the car, tried choke her or, you know, basically because I think he was kind of getting it all out of his system because he knew that his days are coming. And the reason why I mentioned that is because I remember Ted Bundy, once he knew the, his world was coming to an end, he went to the college and started killing, you know, as many as he could while he was in the college, because it was like, I don't want to say it, you know, this way, but it, it truly was what they call a last hurrah. And I think at this point here, I could be wrong, but I think once he killed Melton, I think this guy, Wade Wilson knew it was only a matter of time. So he was going to try to get everything out of the system. So he kind of went, picked up the girl that was, walking um the other young lady uh Ru ruiz or my mind's going blank it's, it's ruiz right and uh basically got her in the car tried to strangle her and then somehow she got out of the car and 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 he wind up running over her but it was such an a uh, an aggressive thing to do that i figured that this guy i think knew his time was coming i think he knew his time was coming and then he was gonna go all out and, and get that last hurrah very similar to ted bundy do you find that to be yeah, uh but, well, I think I think it, I think his the interpretation, um, you know, and I mentioned that earlier. I think the 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 interpretation that he has, based on what I'm looking, what I read and reviewed, is really kind of this what Athens were referred to as frustrative malefic, uh, meaning that he has just this hatred and anger based violence uh, that uh, really kind of compels him to commit those atrocities, to commit the to, to commit those murders. And so, you know, um, you know, the second woman he wound up uh, killing was probably, you know, wrong place, wrong time. It could have been anybody. You know, opportunity, it, right? You know, the opportunity was there. Um, and he was just he was just looking to kill somebody. And, you know, um, and, and 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 obviously preferably a woman. Um, he sort of sort of, you know, honed in on women. If you take a look at the pattern that he had with those ex-girlfriends, um, uh, and then ultimately the two women, um, that he murdered. So, you know, it, and it could have been any woman. And so I don't think he was targeting that particular woman on the street. I just think that they were opportunistic opportunity and, uh, he was just filled with such rage, um, that he, you know, ultimately killed her. And, um, and again, you know, you may be right. Maybe he, he was trying to double down on the, the notoriety of what he did, which again, then, uh, led to him, led to that phone call to his biological father. And, um, you know, he's just, he, he, um, he, you know, he, um, he felt in power, right. He felt that power and, you know, took all the power and the literal life out of those two women that he enjoyed doing. You, you know, what's funny. I was reading, uh, reading, but I was, I was reading um, John Douglas. I think it is. I wind up buying his book, mind Hunter. I think it's John Douglas. I think that's his name. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I think it's John Douglas. He was a criminal profiler. Let me just make sure I'm giving the right name before I get double checked on YouTube here. Hold on a second. <laughs> I, 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 he has a book called mine. Yes. Well, it says it, it, it's it's Doug, John Douglas. Thank you. All right. So I was doing some reading on him and he did focus uh, on a lot of people. Um, you know, uh, I think Kemper was one. Uh, Ted Bundy was one. And basically he said that kind of when it gets to the end uh, and they know, like at first it's very strategic, you know, like Ted Bundy, would, Ted Bundy would pretend he's injured and then approach the women and they would be attracted to some level of vulnerability. Let me help him. And then eventually he'd become this this monster uh, that was tough to see on the surface, but he, he he truly was underneath. And I think that what happens is they they could do this route and do that last hurrah and then burn themselves out to where they don't ever have the urge again. 
you know, that's what he mentioned. Like, you know, he basically said sometimes they do this last hurrah. Like, you know, again, this could have been Wilson knew he was going to get caught. So he's trying to go for that last hurrah. He's trying to go ahead and, you know, I don't know if, it, like you said, it could be about him wanting to be notorious or, it could you know, be and, and, and well, and you can see, you know, um, if notoriety is what he was after, well, notoriety is what he got. Right? He got it. Yep. He got it. You know, if you take a look in terms of the the, the media and the, the exposure that this particular case has, ha has had since 2019, right? It's been five, yeah. four, five years. Um, if you take a look at the, the exposure of all, and I'm, I'm individuals on both camps, mind you, right? The people who are pleading with the judge for leniency, and then the other folks on the other camp who are, you know, want the book thrown at him, so to speak. So, you know, he, he got the notoriety and, you know, maybe that's what he was looking for. Right. Uh, or maybe, you know, maybe that's what in fact, you know, ultimately his goal was um, as he, as he graduated right to this uh, fourth and final stage of rule, let's say. So like, so let me ask you one, again, just the way, just talking to you, you can learn, you just learn so much, but if he wasn't caught and kind of like, you know, he was in this process of like, you know, just one after the other. I mean, a couple hours after the, the first one, he went after the second one. Do you think that if he wasn't caught, uh, he would have killed again? I, based on what I've read and based on the, how this whole thing has transpired, um, if he never made that phone call to his biological father and the father um, didn't make that phone call, uh, you know, I don't doubt that he would have killed again, right? Mm. And that that that's part of the theory as well. Like once you get to a point of stage four ruling, where the person is um, has this ultra violent self image and will attack anybody for the slightest of provocation, uh, well, that's what the system to incapacitate the those types of folks, right? That's what it's built for certainly right so when you when you're talking about when we talk about the system to say well it should be tailored you shouldn't just lock everyone up um there's some you know there's a lot of truth in that right so you should um use it quote unquote judiciously really kind of incapacitate the people who need to be incapacitated right that's what the system is sort of should be built around when we're talking about uh corrections um uh, and incapacitate them uh, to to the extent necessary. And in the state of Florida, the law is what the law is. And so the judge saw fit that under the circumstances uh, that he was going to uh, administer two death sentences uh, as the judgment of conviction there. So um, so the theory recognizes that, right? It recognizes that there are certain individuals when they reach the certain threshold that you, the system, in order to maintain its legitimacy in the eyes of the public, there's no other choice than to incapacitate them. Mm. As opposed to, you know, you have the kid who's being brutalized, is reached that violent resolution, but hasn't committed any violent performance yet. Well, then the system should be handling those kind of folks differently, right? We shouldn't be locking those folks up, right? We should pre We should be doing things in the system to otherwise divert them, right? So I was going to mention this before, and I just rem reminded myself about it, is part of the problem when we look at the system, and Anthony, you know this, if I prevent somebody from doing something, that's hard to measure, right? And so preventative policy doesn't get the same, unfortunately, uh, probably, I should say, doesn't get the same level of exposure that it, that it, that it deserves then those kinds of approaches and strategies and policies that are more reactive in nature, right? So, uh, but I'm a strong believer in prevention, right? If and, and targeting young people and targeting the most vulnerable populations, particularly, you know, in the inner city and having the kind of experiences I had as a young person growing up uh, in the inner city my whole life and the kind of all sorts of negative experiences and exposures. I don't need to, re, you know, to remind you about, you know, the kinds of things that you, you know, a young person exposed to in those kind in that kind of element. So, 
prevention in those kind of environments to those vulnerable populations is really critical, very important. And theory recognizes that in that stage one and stage two. And even in some instances, stage three, when the person has had a couple of violent performances, has had a couple of wins, a couple of defeats, but just hasn't flipped the switch just yet to get to that stage four and turn into a Wade Wilson, right? So the theory recognizes all that. And so there's, I think, uh, to Athens's credit, I think it creates very good, uh, very good balance. Do you think, we talked about this in the car before, but do you think the feelings of remorse have ever existed lessen at each level? Remorse, like I'm, I'm sorry for what I did. Yeah, like, like basically, uh, you, know, you, know, you, get, you know, you get to a point. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not a psychologist, so I can't really speak to, you know, what necessarily, um, you know, what necessarily, you know, you know his, uh, you know, what he's thinking necessarily. But, you know, his, his, uh, his defense counsel, I believe, described him. As, uh, as having a diseased mind, right? Mm -hmm. Quote, unquote, a diseased mind, um, you know, and she mentioned, you know, the disease of addiction, you know, as part and parcel to that. He has, you know, you could describe it, I guess, as that as a diseased mind, but I would describe the diseased mind in the context of, you know, how he sees the world, his, his interpretation of people's intents, people's attitudes, people's perspectives, the people around him, the world around him. You know, folks who have that quote unquote kind of diseased mind as she characterized it, see the world very differently, much differently um, than you or I, than a person who's law abiding, than a person who's not apt to commit violence against other, any other human being unless they're seriously compelled to in, as a way of self-defense, let's say, right? Um, they see the world in a much different, through a much different side of the prism than we do. So when we just say, I was like, well, that person's quote unquote crazy, right? Well, I don't describe anybody as crazy because that's kind of like taking a shortcut to thinking. I wouldn't describe the person as crazy. I would describe them as thinking differently, right? They see that if you're on the street and somebody is walking down the sidewalk and bumps into you, you're not going to violently attack that person because they bumped into you, right? And they looked at you yeah. sideways. You're just going to keep walking, minding your business and move forward, right? Uh, some other individuals who see the world much differently may see that as such an, uh, an abject uh, form of disrespect that they're willing to take your life over it. That's how they see it. They see disrespect heightened to, to the extent that they're willing to, to commit a violent act over it to seriously injure or even kill you. They're not crazy. They're just interpreting that circumstance and that individual's attitude differently than you or I are. Yeah, one of the things I noticed in my time is we have a, a thing, uh, it's, it's called like a focus on the victim where we introduce uh, inmates to uh, victims of crimes to try to see um, if they can understand the other perspective. How does it feel to be on the other end of the crime. And you get some people that I, I, I think it's a phenomenal program. It's not just done where I'm at. I mean, it, it's a, it's a, it's a national wide program. I've seen it in other places or heard about it in other places, but what they tend to do is uh, they look for little hints of remorse. And what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes people are able to minimize regret because they come up with justifications for what they've done. That doesn't mean that uh, they don't, uh, slightly feel wrong or regret for what they've done. They've just minimized it because they're able to provide an excuse for it. And in their mind, we see it as an excuse. In their mind, it's a reason. But then you get other people who truly have no revort and no remorse. And when you ask them why, it's pretty much they'll tell you, this is who I am. This is what I do. You know, it, it's like they get so connected to the action that they don't even look to minimize it. There's no regret in them. They just don't, they don't see as what they've done is wrong because it's either what's owed to me. It's my world. It's, you know, and, and it's a totally different ball game where the person who's maybe lived on an excuse of, well, I had to rob them because my family um, didn't have money that day and I had to, okay. So there's some level of maybe regret there, but they've learned to settle into that excuse. So once they remove the, the excuse and let them know, no, what you did was wrong. Those, those people actually have a, a good chance to influence them going in the right way because they, you know, these people lived on that excuse, but there are somewhere they just know you can't. I said, how do you know? It's like, because it's become who they are. 
Mm. They don't they don't minimize the excuse. They literally say this is who I am. Uh, right. And I think that's. Yeah. So it's like how you see yourself. You know, can you can you change your self image? Right. Well, you can. Yeah. You're going to have a you're going to have a psychological breakdown in order to change your self image. Right. You, you're you going to have. Well, a, you mentioned that. Right. You're Charles, going to have you mention. Yeah. You're going to have a serious. Can you change your self image? How you see that perspective, everything you've ever known in your life has been wrong and detrimental. And for you to turn your back on all that is not a simple, easy, and easy undertaking. That is a serious um, intervention of basic crisis, of epic crisis proportions. It's like when you go through any kind of serious change over the course of your life where you're breaking down your self-image to rebuild it again in a different yes. Uh, you know, in a different form. That's not that's not something that uh, is an easy, uh, inconsequential kind of undertaking. That is very serious, and it provides guidance because the default is always going to be towards what you know best because that's the easier route. So you of need course. someone next to you to. Hey, Joe, you have anything you like to say in closing? Uh, it's been a pleasure, Anthony. Thank you so much. It's been a, a great academic discussion. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, hopefully your audience enjoys it as well. Yes. And, and Joe, the movie, what do we got? Uh, and you also, I believe you have some, uh, books out too, correct? Oh yeah. I got some uh, books, uh, I leave book courthouse confidential that deals with, uh, you know, my work in the courts. It's a case study, uh, book. Um, uh, but the film is available on Amazon prime. It's called why they kill. And it kind of goes into if, you know, under an hour, 58 minute, uh, film that basically breaks down, uh, Athens is uh, violinization theory. Yeah, and then guys, in three years when I retire, me and Joe will probably work on a movie together eventually. I mean, the <laughs> it's it, it's up and coming, man. I mean, just tell me where you want me to be. Um, no, but you, I hope you, guys, you, talk, you tell me where you want me to be, and I'll be there. Ah, Joe, trust me, Joe. I, I, I you have no idea. I look up to everything you've accomplished. Uh, I just love likewise, my class. friend. Likewise. I mean, guys, I get to go to his class and speak to the kids of tomorrow, and he just provides such an objective look where. Working in corrections, you get people that are so biased because they only see one perspective. But when you go in Joe's class, you just know that they're informed and they're just so welcoming to understanding both sides. You know, it's, it's not about living in extremes, but rather where are we in the middle so we can move things forward. Uh, and, and it's from an honest perspective, like what Joe teaches. So as always, guys, the show is Tirtha. I hope you guys enjoyed the dialogue. Uh, I will try to get more. I'm, I'm going to try to also start bringing on victims from certain crimes as well so we can get an understanding of how those crimes uh, have affected them. And then obviously we're going to have to have Joe on again because uh, there's another topic I want to cover with Joe in the near future. When he's ready, I would like to maybe talk about, um, you know, the methods that they choose and what that says about them, if, that, if that's okay. And uh, yep, as always, guys, take care. I love you guys. Stay safe. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you, sir.